Hello and welcome to the fifth installment of our webinar series, Art and Architecture with Kurt DiCamillo. My name is Ginevra Morse. I manage all events and programs here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator and virtual MC for today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We are the oldest and largest genealogical organization in the country and we specialize in providing resources, research, and expertise that uncover the stories of families, family objects, and family homes. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Now during the interwar years between 1919 and 1939, much of England's upper class lifestyle was characterized by fast cars and a, an abundance of glamour and glitter. Today Kurt will take us us from the 17th century to present day, sharing the tastes, hobbies, homes, and the need for speed of English, England's fast set. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to type them into the question panel at any point during the presentation. We will answer as many as we can at the end. And I also want to note that we are still broadcasting from our homes to your home with various limitations and distractions. We do apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end. And we thank you for your patience. Even if we do lose connection, you will have access to a full recording of this session on our website as well as our YouTube channel. So our presenter today is Kurt DiCamillo, an internationally recognized authority on English country houses and the decorative arts. Kurt joined American Ancestors in February 2016 as our first curator of special collections. A longtime member of American Ancestors, Kurt has led highly successful heritage tours for our organization to England, Scotland, and Italy. He's lectured extensively in the United States and abroad and taught classes on British culture and art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Kurt was previously executive director of the National Trust for Scotland Foundation, USA. And as curator of special collections here at NEHGS, Kurt provides strategic direction and expert guidance for organizing and exhibiting our extensive collection of family history related artifacts. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kurt DiCamillo. Good afternoon, everybody from a beautiful sun-filled Boston. I was prepared to tell everybody to have a G&T, a gin and tonic, or a PIMS in your hand, because this is the appropriate drink for what we're about to see. But literally minutes before I signed on to do this, I got an email from Buckingham Palace that said that this is National Afternoon Tea Week in Britain. So apparently tea is what you should be having, although I'm sure you could spike it with a little something. So we're starting off in Kent, as you can see, um, this amazing house called Highham Park in Kent, which is a private house that's not open to the public today, but which has a very distinguished history. What you see here is primarily built in the 17th and 18th centuries, and it was beginning in the 18th century that Hyam was a destination for international notoriety. And in this case, I'm talking about Mozart, who came here when he was nine years old in 1765 to play for a distinguished group of visitors. And it's interesting to realize why he came here. His father is trying to get him exposed to as many people as possible who had money and titles. And those sorts of people gathered at Hyam because horse racing was a very big thing here in the 18th century. And horse racing had become by the 18th century a very wealthy sport, a sport focused on people with money. In the 19th century, we know that Hyam was um, someplace that was visited by Jane Austen quite regularly. She and her sister talk about it in their jottings and their writings coming here and what a beautiful part of the countryside this is. The real reason we're here at the core of everything that I want to talk to you about is actually something you're going to see in the next slide, which is one of the most famous characters of, I think, anywhere in the world in fiction, and that, of course, is James Bond, 007. But let me set you up into how this came to be. In the early 20th century, this house was built by, I'm sorry, was bought by this man's mother. Yes, this is actually a man. He's a boy here. He has not been breached yet, so he's still wearing a dress. But this is Count Louis Zborowski. 
at the age of three. His father was a Polish count. His mother was an Astor from New York City. And when she died in 1911, when he was 16 years old, she left him seven acres of Manhattan and approximately $10 billion in today's values. And he decided to take this money and to do something that his father had done and something that he felt was very much a part of him and his bloodline, and that is to race fast cars. So amazingly enough, this little part of Kent became the world center for fast cars. And they weren't just raced here, they were also built here. And you can see Count Louis here in 1920 driving one of these cars that he was very much a part of inventing. And because this was a, a big destination, this is just after the Great War, after World War I, you had people coming from all over Britain to watch these races. And of course, nothing could be more attractive to a young boy than a fast car in a race. And in this case, the young boy that I'm talking about was named Ian Fleming, who we know came here on the 007 bus from London to Dover, specifically to watch these races as a 12-year-old. As a and there can be no, no doubt that this is the beginning of the bits and pieces that formed his story for James Bond. But the core that brings all this together is World War I, because the men that the Count employed to build and race his cars were veterans who had come back from the trenches of France and fought in the Western Front during World War I. And there are two key parts of this story that come out of this. These men were very much a part of the first modern intelligence gathering, what we today call MI6, which is who James Bond works for, was formed in the early 20th century and really, World War I was the very first major battle, the very first war that modern intelligence was, was used. So it, to my mind, there's no doubt that James Bond and the ideas for him were given to Ian Fleming by the stories that we know he heard from these men who were working on these cars and had come back from the war. I'm sure they exaggerated quite a bit, but there were good stories in there nonetheless. The other thing that's going on here is that there is um, the bawdier side of these men. They all talked about when they were on the Western Front, what they lived for was to get a pass to go to Paris. And that was called a chit. And when they went to Paris, most of them went to houses of prostitution. And they called this getting a bang. So you had what the guys called a chitty chitty bang bang. That was to get fun in Paris. and these early cars that were being built at Haim were called Chitty Bang Bang because the backfiring of the car sounded like that. And of course, that's why Ian Fleming wrote the book, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, which of course later became the movie, something else that started this quiet little corner of Kent. Um, and you can see in this next slide, the Count who um, was probably not quite as handsome as I would like, but he did have a lot of money. And here's, he's in one of his um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bangs here. He was so rich and so influential that his success in motor racing brought the aristocracy to the sport, which had heretofore been considered something that was really just for working class people. And his influence didn't end there. His colors, because you had your own colors, your own team colors when you raced, his color was a dark green. And that green, is what is known today as British racing green. And I'm showing you the 1953 Jag that I think is one of the most beautiful cars ever built, an XK120, that is a perfect evocation of that color green and the idea of British racing. As you can see at the bottom, um, the Count died at the age of 28 in 1924, racing a car in Italy for Mercedes. Um, he died the way he lived and I'm sure he didn't have any children. I've often wondered what happened to all that delicious money. Um, but speaking of cars, we have to talk about what a lot of people consider to be the most famous car of all time, which is the 1964 Aston Martin DB5 that you see before you here. This is the actual one that was used in the filming 
of both Goldfinger and Thunderball, the James Bond movies. And you can see here in 2010, it sold for $4.6 million at an auction to an Ohio collector. This car was revolutionary because at the time when it was brought out in Britain, it was the epitome of stylistic race cars. Interestingly enough, considering how much product placement is a part of what we do today in movies, Aston Martin didn't want to lend this car to the movie production. They thought it, that somehow it would diminish it. Of course, as you all know today, companies like Aston Martin pay movie companies to put their products in their movies. This had all these lovely things that you see in the bottom right, revolving license plates, a bulletproof shield, an oil slick sprayer, machine guns, a smoke screen, a nail spreader, and of course, an ejector seat. Of course, only half of these things actually work. The rest of them were props. They're set up by the movie company, but still, nonetheless, hot damn, that was one hell of a car. Now, let's look at, I think, one of the best ever made of all the Bond movies, which is Goldfinger. There are three um, visual elements that I have here pointed to for um, the Goldfinger movie poster. The first one, of course, is the car itself, number one, which appears here. Number two is Odd Job with his killer top hat, you see. And then number three at the very top is um, Stoke Park. And I'm going to talk about all three of these. Well, we've already talked about the car. We're going to talk about um, Odd Job next. So, Odd Job. Um, Harold Sakata, who played him, was actually a Korean wrestler. And you see him here as the caddy for Goldfinger when Goldfinger played James Bond in a golf match. And this was filmed at a house called Stoke Park, which was then as now um, a golf club. But of course, like all these great houses, it was built as a house, a private house, not as a golf club. And it has a unique story to American history because it was built by the grandson of William Penn, who founded Pennsylvania, the only white man that never broke a treaty with the Native Americans, and who set forth as a Quaker in the founding of the Pennsylvania government, the basis that was used for the inspiration of the Constitution of the United States. So with all that, you would say, well, well so why is his grandson building this house in Buckinghamshire, England? And that's because when the United States was formed, as an independent country, Pennsylvania was a proprietary colony. It was actually owned by the Penn family. And they had to be bought out by the new government of the United States. So one of the very first issuances of debt by the new government was to borrow the equivalent of $900 million to buy the 26 million acres of Pennsylvania. And of course, Pennsylvania uh, means Penn's woods from the family. And the family was like, Bye. They took that $900 million. They went back to England. They converted to Church of England, to Anglican, and they never looked back. They built this big house, and they were no longer Quakers. They were no longer part of this great pin idea of Quakerism. But it's a lovely, luscious story. What you see before you here um, is my 1976 bicycle license plate. I was 15 in 1976. I love the bicentennial, and I am a native Pennsylvanian, so that's why I thought this was an appropriate thing to show you to get you that Pennsylvania message across. So for those who remember 2012, and hopefully everybody does because it wasn't that long ago, and the movie Skyfall, this had a very famous recurrence of the Aston Martin DB5, not an original, but one that was made in 2010 specifically for the movie. And you see um, Judy Dench here, this is sadly the one where she dies, um, standing in front of this famous car in Scotland, because of course Skyfall refers to James Bond's ancestral state, which took place in Scotland. And it's sort of a wonderful summing up of the history of decades of James Bond and stylish cars. And I don't think, regardless of all the cars that came since, nothing can replace that Aston Martin. Now, to talk about big houses, I think it's important to start with this one, Wentworth Woodhouse in Yorkshire. And I know some of you who are listening today have been with me here when we did a tour of Yorkshire. In the next slide, you'll see um, why this is the house with the longest facade of any private house in Europe. Sadly, this is not even the whole thing. I couldn't get the whole thing in the shot. It's actually longer than it looks on both sides here. This is twice as long as Buckingham Palace. It has 365 rooms, 1,000 windows, five miles of underground passages, 
and it sits in an estate of 19,000 acres. My favorite story, which you'll see there to the right, is that um, when you were a guest here, you were given a little silver canister with a color of confetti, and that color was unique to you. And you would use that to create a path from your bedroom to the public room so you could find your way back at night. If you had a house this big, you wanted to show it off to everybody. So in the early 18th century, um, they built a viewing platform, which is called Hoover Stand, just under 100 feet tall. As you can see here, it was quoted by Arthur Young, an inveterate traveler in the 18th century as containing perhaps the most beautiful view in Yorkshire. This next slide shows you the view. Um, and the whole point of this was to look at the house. This for me was a big feat, I'm afraid of heights. And I got to the edge of the stand to take this picture of Wentworth Woodhouse and it shows you the majesty of what an English estate really is all about. An agricultural centerpiece, great arch, hopefully happy, happy tenants. And as you might imagine, the inside is as grand as you would expect. The most famous room is the Great Hall, what you see before you, a 60 foot square with 40 foot ceilings. It was called by the same guy, Arthur Young in 1768, beyond all comparison, the finest room in England. And it's now, as all of this house being restored, and we can talk about that in the question and answer session, if you guys are interested. But this house was famous, not just now, because it's a cause celeb in Britain, um, but it was famous even in the 18th century and even in France. God forbid France would be interested in anything British. And what I'm showing you in the next slide is a plate that was made in France um, in 1790 that has the facade of Wentworth Woodhouse on it. This was, for those of you who can cast your minds back to 1985, um, one of the plates that was displayed in the Treasure Houses of Britain exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington. In the next slide, you'll see something that I bought on eBay, which is um, a medal, a bronze medal, that was um, issued in 1886 to mark um, an exhibition of which the owner of the house, the sixth Earl Fitzwilliam was president, and to honor him, they put this, um, this engraving of his house on the front, which once again, you can see there's no way to get the whole thing, the whole facade in one view, which just sort of boggles your mind. But the real reason we're here is because of the man who owned the house in the 18th century, the second Marquess of Rockingham, who you see here, who was a Whig, so a liberal, and he was prime minister during George III's reign. But his big passion was horses. And I want you to look at the stables that he built for his horses. And you're seeing one facade here. This is a square. So there are obviously three more equal size and there's a courtyard in the middle. This is how much he valued his horses. And for him, horses weren't just something to ride and to love, but something to race. And possibly the most famous horse in British racing history was his, it's a horse called Whistlejacket. You see here painted by George Stubbs. Um, it's now in the National Gallery in London Whistlejacket is important for all kinds of reasons. He only lost four races in his career. He was considered to be um, the original coloring of um, the wild Arabian horses from which all thoroughbreds are supposedly bred. My favorite part is that he was named after an 18th century cold remedy that contained gin and treacle. So important was this horse and so much money did he win for his owner that he took a room in his house and rebuilt it around this portrait which is huge and the room then is now is called the whistle jacket room and you can see here in a late 19th early 20th century photograph of that room how much this horse dominated that room the room is still there we actually on during our tour a couple years ago had lunch in the whistle jacket room what you see there today is a modern copy to replace the original the copy isn't quite as wonderful as the original in the National Gallery, which I have to say, I'm not a big horse lover, but you see this painting and you're just like, wow, what an artist. Now we come down to the mid 20th century and the owner by this time was the eighth Earl Fitzwilliam, who was the last titled owner to live in the house. And he was engaged to Kathleen Kennedy, 
the sister of JFK, and you see them here together in a very rare photograph. Rare because they kept this a secret. And um, very sadly, in May of 1948, they got on a plane in Paris to fly to the Riviera for vacation, and very bad things happened with the weather, and the plane crashed, and everybody on it died. And this was the beginning of the end of Wentworth Woodhouse as a great private house. Um, as I say, I've never lived in again. I titled member of the family, and the contents were little by little sold off. All of this is documented in a wonderful book written in 2008 by Catherine Bailey called Black Diamonds, The Rise and Fall of an English Dynasty. Black Diamonds, in this case, of course, refers to coal, and that's where the money was made by the family. They had 150 coal mines and employed 115,000 coal miners in their mines. And this is a juicy book. It's well written. It's got all kinds of salacious suggestions, changelings, illegitimacy, ooh, just murder even. It's, it's And it's all true. <laughs> I mean, that's the best part about it. Now, I'm going to take you to Bedfordshire and specifically to this man, John Ian Robert Russell, who became the 13th Duke of Bedford in 1953. This is one of the most ancient titles in Britain. Um, unfortunately for him, he got the title and lots of assets, but not much money. And his family had once been very, very wealthy indeed. As a matter of fact, if any of you have been to Covent Garden in London, that was owned by the family. It was developed into a great marketplace in the 18th century. It's actually, the word coven is a corruption of the word convent, because originally here on this land, in the um, before the dissolution of the monasteries, this had been, would you never, can we go back? I think we skipped one. Um, Hmm. Oh, you have a different version, Ginevra. I know what it is. You and I are looking at different versions. Um, that's all right. There we go. There's Covent Garden. Woohoo! So this was sold by um, the 13th Duke's grandfather in 1918 to raise money to pay death duties. So when the Duke inherited his house, which you see here in this next slide, Woburn Abbey in Bedfordshire, um, it's rather a large house. <laughs> he didn't have a lot of money. And he was one of the very first peers to open his house to the public. And it's interesting because this was something that was severely criticized at the time by his, by his fellow peers as being very déclassé. You don't open your house to paying members of the public. But he had to find a way to make money to keep the house together. And opening the house by itself wasn't enough. So in 1970, he tried something else, which is bringing in lions and tigers and bears and basically every kind of exotic African animal you can think of. And he formed the Woburn Safari Park, which is still one of the biggest draws today at Woburn Abbey. And it's more than that because the real reason we're here today is to talk about airplane racing, which is very much a part of the DNA of Woburn Abbey. You're looking here at a tiger moth um, taking off from the front lawn at Woburn Abbey in 2006. Moths have a very important part of the history of Woburn Abbey. Um, there's a moth club and every August they meet for two days. They come from, fly in from all over the world to land on the front lawn of Woburn Abbey for their, their annual moth meet. Um, this brings a lot of money in and it brings a lot of attention, but it's important to talk about where it got started and believe it or not, it got started in the early 20th century by um, Mary, who was the wife of the 11th Duke, the one who sold Woburn Abbey, I'm mean, the one who sold um, Covent Garden. You see her here dressed as a nurse. She um, was unusual for a duchess in that she cared about people more than objects. She founded this little hospital she called Maryland's on the state grounds to treat the locals. She believed um, that people should be treated equally. She believed that birds and animals had feelings and should be treated the same as humans. She took her yacht, um, which is an amazing yacht called Sapphire, which you'll see in this next slide. And she took it all over the world to document exotic birds and to, to have them painted and drawn so they could never be lost. And then in 1925, at the age of 61, she took her first lesson and she learned how to fly. And what she flew was a gypsy moth. And what's amazing is just 
four short years later, she broke the speed record flying between England and India. Now, this is amazing for all kinds of reasons. Women didn't fly very often, Amelia Earhart aside. A duchess certainly didn't fly, and certainly not one who was in her mid-60s. And she was called, in her own lifetime, the Flying Duchess. She's still called that today. And she's one of the biggest reasons that people come to Woburn Abbey, other than to see the great collections there. And you see her here in a 2008 book called The High Flying Duchess that I really recommend. She didn't really like being a duchess very much. She liked doing things that helped people. But she had quite a house. And you'll see in this next slide the view of her house from the air. This is the front lawn that she used to land in and where the, where the malls land today. Um, <laughs> I look at this view of Woburn Abbey, and I'm reminded of um, a famous wag who said, at looking at this house, it's what God would have done if he'd had the money. They were not a poor family. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we got to have malls in this world. And it's all because of this man. Jeffrey de Havilland, who in 1909 built one of the very first workable planes in Britain. And in 1920, he founded the de Havilland Aircraft Company. And in the 20s and 30s, he did a whole series of moths. The gypsy moth that the Flying Duchess used, the tiger moth, the leopard moth, and so forth and so on, and down to the unfortunately named puss moth, which I will get back to in a few minutes. Um, but these were the runabouts of their day. They were very hard, you could work and work and work them and they would keep on going. They were inexpensive. They were all biplanes and they were used throughout World War II, in fact. But speaking of World War II, it's important to talk about one of the most amazing contributions that de Havilland made to air and fighting during that time, which is the mosquito, as you see here, um, which the Brits would pronounce mosquito. This is unusual in that it was both a fighter and a bomber. In 1941, it was the fastest plane in the world, and that is because it was mostly constructed of wood, so obviously very light. Um, there were problems with that. It was called the Wooden Wonder by the press. The men who flew it called it the Timber Terror, because think about it, you know, you've got plywood here. <laughs> Not a lot of protection, and if you get fired on, it goes down in flames very quickly, and it, it did do that, but it was an amazing achievement for its time, and the de Havilland Company built on this success. In the 1950s, they introduced the world's first jet that was a passenger jet, the de Havilland Comet that you see here. Um, it's unfortunate that this um, didn't um, succeed in the way they had anticipated because it had this unfortunate tendency to break apart in mid-flight. And um, this is because of catastrophic metal fatigue and because of this, because of the inroads that de Havilland made, Boeing came later using their technology. And we would probably be having a de Havilland jet now instead of a Boeing if it hadn't been for the, the um, metal fatigue that affected this wonderful plane. So back to <laughs> the puss moth. So I think an awful lot of James Bond comes into play in the making of this. So this is Pussy Galore, you see in the movie poster and there on the right. And she, um, of course, was a pilot in Goldfinger. And I can't help but think that Ian Fleming, who we know flew in moths during the war, didn't have the puss moth in the back of his mind when he created this imaginary pilot called Pussy Galore. Um, which I still can't believe today in 2020 is a character in a movie, much less in the 1960s. So I think we can't leave Wilbur Abbey without talking a little bit about the insides because it is a spectacular treasure house. And the, um, one of the most important rooms I'm going to talk about is the blue drawing room, which you see here. Important not only because of its great art collection, but specifically because of Anna Maria, who is the wife of the seventh Duke and who was a great friend of Queen Victoria. And it was in this room in the 1840s that she first started doing something that we think of today as being so British, and that is afternoon tea. It's hard to imagine that not that long ago, because in my mind as a historian, 1840 is not that long ago, that this tradition we think of as being so thoroughly British started, and it started at this particular house. For real art bling, um, we, we're going to go to the dining room where you can see some 
of the 24 canalettos that were commissioned by the fourth Duke of Bedford um, that are hanging in the hall. The whole room is furnished with nothing but canalettos. And it's important to talk about how these came into this room because when Ian, the 13th Duke, who you saw earlier, inherited the house in the 1950s, it had been occupied as all these great houses had during the war by the army who had treated very badly. And he talks about how he and his wife literally discovered these canalettos stacked up against each other in a shed and said, oh, look, what do we have here? And he's the one that reinterpreted this house, opened it to the public, and made it the great showpiece that it is today. It also has an amazing survival, which is a grotto. In the 18th century, um, wealthy landowners wanted to have these imaginary grottos, which was the idea of transporting you to a place under the sea. In this case, this is actually um, part of the house. It's a room in the house meant to look like a cave. All the stonework is carved to look like seaweed. Everything else are glued shells that are put up to give you this amazing feeling of being in Neptune's kingdom. And unusually for um, Auburn Abbey, probably because they were so rich, they designed furniture specifically to use in this room. And this is my favorite piece of furniture, this lovely tortoise here. And you'll see in the next slide how he opens up to become what I can only guess was a rather uncomfortable chair, but still wicked cool nonetheless. They had a, that kind of imagination. We're next going to go to Northamptonshire and to a house called Easton Neston. This is considered one of the most important Baroque houses, not just in Britain, but in all of Europe, probably designed by the great English Baroque architect Nicholas Hawksmoor. It was built for the Firmer family who kept it until quite recently, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to first take you inside and talk to you about the two most important things to do with the art here. And those are easiest to point out to you here in the Great Hall. So those two arrows are pointing to a mural on the up, upper part, and the bottom part, we have a statue. And the murals continue all the way up to the staircase. And they were painted by Sir James Thornhill. And I'll talk about him in just a moment. But it's the sculpture we're going to talk about first, because these niches where the sculpture is, or was, these are all copies there today, um, were, these niches were developed specifically to contain the great collection of the 21st heir, Earl of Arundel. You see here in a 17th century portrait, and he is specifically pointing to these ancient sculptures that he collected. Ancient in this case, meaning Rome and Greece. These were pieces. Um, that no one else in England was interested in collecting. And he thought these were the most important things imaginable. His heirs sold them to Sir Thomas Firmer, I'm sorry, Sir William Firmer, who built the house, and he incorporated them into this amazing Baroque masterpiece. All of these pieces are today at the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford, which interestingly enough is one of the world's oldest museums. It was founded in 1683, and it is the world's oldest university museum. And they were given by the family in lieu of death duties, and also because they wanted a permanent home for them. So it's sad that we have plaster copies in those niches today, but it's probably better that they're in a museum because more people can see them there. Now, I also mentioned Sir James Thornhill, who did those wonderful murals on the staircase. Well, he's, um, he's famous for doing um, the murals in this building, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and specifically the murals that you're going to see when you look up into the Great Dome. And this shows you how wealthy Sir William Firmer was when he was having his house built, that he could get somebody as important as this man to do murals for him. The real reason we're here starts with this woman, the Empress Elizabeth of Austria, who you see here. Um, who was married to um, Franz Joseph, the Emperor of Austria. She was sort of the Princess Diana of her day. She was beautiful. She was thin. She was on diets all the time. She didn't like her husband. She didn't like Austria. She spent most of her life after she had her children traveling around Europe without any family members. <laughs> Interesting marriage. Um, she loved hunting. And by the 19th century, the family that owned this house needed money and they leased it to the Empress Elizabeth. And you see her here in an illustration from Vanity Fair. 
And on the right, you see the, the logo, believe it or not, that's pronounced toaster, um, of the toaster race course, which is on the estate. She loved hunting, and she's one that made it very stylish, especially the way she's dressed here. And people, literally the press even then, followed her from country to country to sort of write about what she was doing. So when she hunted, when she raced, everybody else did it. And you can see in this next slide, her bedroom at Easton Neston, which is not hugely impressive. Um, this is from the Sotheby's auction catalog, and it always bothers me that somebody at Sotheby's didn't have the presence of mind to straighten that lampshade on the left there. But um, it's, it's a nice bedroom, it, it, it will do. So Cece is what she was called, the Empress Elizabeth. Um, she was very sadly murdered um, in September of 1898 by an Italian anarchist. And you see a depiction of her being stabbed by him here. Um, he later said he didn't go after her specifically. He just wanted to kill somebody who was royal because he resented royalty. And interestingly enough, they thought this was a flesh wound at first. Even the Empress thought it was a flesh wound because there was very little blood. And she did not travel with any security. She just had a lady in waiting who you see behind her here. And they went into her cabin on the boat that she boarded, thinking it was just minor, and they undid her corset. And the corset was holding all the blood in. And when the corset came off, she bled out and instantly died. And um, was still a great beauty and very sad, very sad story. She was a very sad um, woman. Her son committed suicide. So not a happy family. This next slide is a picture of the man who leased her this house. Sir Thomas Firmer Hesketh. He, um, as you can tell, <laughs> loved Asian dress. He also needed money, which is why he leased her the house. He then got in his yacht. Yes, he wasn't that poor. He still had a yacht um, that was called the Lancashire Witch. And he sailed to San Francisco to look for a rich wife. And this is very reminiscent um, of the story of Downton Abbey, because if you can think back to the very early episodes of Downton Abbey, um, when Lord Grantham admits that he married his wife for money, but then grew to love her, that was the same situation, although sadly in this case, love did not ensue. Um, this is who he married, um, Florence Emily Sharon, very pretty San Franciscan. This is her father, <laughs> Senator William Sharon, who you can just tell from this photograph, he was dirty as they came, and, and he was. He came to California from Ohio as a 49er, and much like Levi Strauss, he discovered that the way to make money wasn't to go into the gold fields, it was to actually sell things to the miners. And he sold all kinds of things. He was in real estate development. He eventually founded the Bank of California and became the second richest man in the American West. And um, <laughs> he was very happy to, to have his daughter become a lady. And she thought this is what she wanted too. As I say, unfortunately, it was not a happy marriage. Um, she wanted a life of great luxury, and she had it. She wanted society. Her husband was not interested in that. He was interested in tinkering. And interestingly enough, he built behind the stables at Easton Neston in his workshop the very first motor car ever made in England. So it's interesting that his descendant, um, Lord Hefkes, who you see here, who's still with us today, um, in 1972 founded Hesketh Racing, which from 1973 until 1978 raced Formula One cars. And you can see um, one of his cars here, the Hesketh 308, custom built car that he had that, um, <laughs> he's an interesting character. His, his entire racing team arrived at every race in a fleet of Rolls Royces. They drank champagne after each race, regardless of the results of the race, and they only stayed in five-star hotels. So it probably won't surprise you to hear that um, he went through a lot of money, and he had to stop racing and find a way to make money, and he decided the way to do that would be to capitalize on his name and manufacture motorcycles. So this is Lord Hess just in front of Easton Neston with his motorcycle range. Um, this is the Vampire Super Tour, and you'll see in this next um, image, a close up of one of these bikes. Unfortunately, the bikes were very heavy. They were too heavy and they had this um, bad habit of exploding while you were riding them and burning. So um, the company went bankrupt 
and Lord Heskus had pretty much come to the end of the rope financially. So in 2005, he had to sell the house and all the contents of the house to pay his creditors. And what you're looking at here is the cover of the Sotheby's catalog for the auction of the contents of the house. This is one of two volumes. And I'm gonna show you a few of the pieces that are my most favorite that were coming up in this auction. The first is this one, the Rothschild rock crystal chandelier that sold for 102,000 pounds. This is important to me because chandeliers are usually made of glass. And this is made of cut rock crystals in my precious stone. Um, and it's because it was made for the Rothschild family who loved everything big and blingy, you can sort of understand where it came from, an astonishing survival. The next piece I'm gonna show you is the undoubted star of this auction. This is an early 14th, late 15th century English bronze jug that sold for just under $1 million. And that was against an estimate of about 80,000 pounds. They went so far over the estimate because it's so rare. Very few things from this time period survive. And this is an exceptionally good example. The saddest thing that came out of this, I think, um, was the, the sale of the, the um, coronet of the Earls of Pomfret, which is one of the titles of the family that showed you every single thing was being sold out to the walls. Um, this went for 5,000 pounds, so just about $8,000. Um, just very sad. This is something you would have worn at the coronation of a king or a queen. Now we're gonna go into Lincolnshire, and in this case to Burley House, which is one of the finest Elizabethan houses in the world. And to show you how immense this house is, I want you to see this photograph of the courtyard here. Um, just an unbelievable house. It was built for this man, William Cecil, first Lord Burley, who was the virtual prime minister to Elizabeth I, and he used his offices, as was the custom, to skim money off the top of the government and to build this great house, which he began in the 1550s. Um, and Elizabeth herself um, trusted him up to the very end. He was considered the best spy, spy master in European history. And you see Elizabeth here in a very rare portrait of her as an older woman, probably in her 60s. She never allowed herself to be appeared as an aging person in any of her portraits. This contrasts very sharply with, um, <laughs> with the lovely Kate Blanchett in the movie Elizabeth. Um, I, I doubt the real Elizabeth was ever quite this beautiful, but still, it, it's, it's a, this house is so evocative of the Elizabethan era. It captures everything that Elizabeth was. And it was originally built in a form of an E in honor of Elizabeth. So if you look at it from the air, it would have had an E shape to it, which it does not now. And I say does not now because things changed over the years. And we have in the 17th century, um, the great Italian painter Antonio Vario, who comes and paints a series of state rooms at Burley House. Um, this is his only room he's painted anywhere in the world that goes from the top to the ceiling and down the other side again. And as you can see, it's called the heaven room. It's meant to be an avocation of heaven. And of course, if you have a heaven room, you have to obviously have a hell room. And in this case, it's called the hell staircase. And it looks very dark in this photograph, which is why in the next slide, you're gonna see a close up of um, <laughs> what it's really like in hell. Pretty, actually pretty bright. Um, lots of naked people, there's some fire going on. Um, but I think all in all, this is not a, not a bad idea of hell. The real reason we're here is because um, of the sixth Marquis of Exeter, who was the man who started horse racing here. And you see him here on the right with the Queen and Princess Margaret in 1967. He founded these horse trials in 1961. And this is an interesting photograph because this was done specifically for the Queen and Margaret to be able to see these horses before the event opened to the public. And the reason for that is even though they were friendly with Lord Exeter, they could not allow themselves to be seen in public with him because he was a divorced man, which I find incredibly ironic considering Princess Margaret and all of the Queen's children save one have since become divorced. But in the 60s, this just wasn't done. What you see today at Burley is one of the most important horsing events of the world. It now is sponsored by Land Rover. And I, I love this jump here because of the boots on either side of it. In the next slide, you'll see a great image of a jump with the house in the background. 
this three day event is held every September. It's the oldest continuous international equestrian event and is one of the world's most important events for any kind of serious horse people. And this is the man who started it all when he was younger. This, this is David Sissel um, before he became the Marquis of Exeter. And if you look closely, the bottom left there, you can see he's wearing shorts in this painting. And he's also wearing his Cambridge blue dressing gown. Um, this was important because he was a runner. And this was commissioned by his, his fellows at Cambridge. And he, much to the distress of his parents, who thought this was very unbecoming for an aristocrat, he became one of the world's fastest runners. You can see here in 1928, he won gold in the Olympics in Amsterdam in the 400 meter hurdles. And in 1932, he won silver in the 400 meter relays. He was just an astonishing, astonishing runner. And if you can think back all the way to 1981 and the movie Chariots of Fire, he, under a different name, was one of the central focuses of this movie. And it starts off, if you can remember, with this, this run that his character does around the flagstones of Trinity College in Cambridge, which is basically a, a courtyard, and he had to run around all four sides before the clock struck 12. He's the only person in history that has ever done this. Many people have tried before him and after him. Everyone has failed, even Olympians who were in theory faster runners. You see here, this is actually from the movie and the actor who's playing him with the blonde hair is coming out in front. And my favorite story about him is when they launched the Queen Mary, in 1936, he was invited to the opening and he appeared in a tuxedo as, as everyone else did. And um, he was asked to show what he could do with his legs. And he ran the entire promenade deck, which is a quarter of a mile all the way around the great ship in 58 seconds in a tuxedo. And that just <laughs> blows my mind. I just want to say, as someone who loves the old ships, the Queen Mary, of course, is the only remaining liner in the world from the golden age um, of the great liners. And you see her here in Long Beach, California, where she's a hotel and entertainment venue. She's just, the ships today, ugh, they're so ugly. This is such a gorgeous ship. Now, horses, horse racing, the sport of kings, comes down to one person, and that's Charles II, who of course was restored to the throne in 1660. And it's because of his love of horse racing that we have the phrase of sport of kings. He's the king that was named after it. He's the one that was so obsessed with horse racing that he would move his entire court every year from London to Suffolk, specifically to Newmarket, which was then, as now, a center for great racing. And um, what I love about how this all got started is that the very first race that took place here, which was in 1622, was a match race. And you see a match race going on right here in this 17th century illustration. So that means those two yellow arrows, those are the two horses in the race. And it's called a match race because it was a match between just those two. All the other people and horses are spectators and people jeering the people and the horses. They're running behind them, they're running beside them and they're yelling insults, you're yelling encouragement because of course all these races were bets. So you were hoping you could get your guy to furnish. It had to be just complete bedlam, but it's the beginning of the sport of kings. And as you'll see in this next slide, it still is because um, this is the same scene today at Newmarket. And you'll see up there in the logo, it says um, the home of racing because it really is where horse racing began. Since um, the 18th century, this new market course has been owned by the Jockey Club, who of course are the world's biggest promoters of horse racing. And it's not a coincidence that the next house we're gonna go to, Goodwood House in Sussex, was um, the family home of one of the founders of the Jockey Club, the third Earl of Richmond, sorry, the third Duke of Richmond. Today, Goodwood is famous for three different kinds of racing. Glorious Goodwood, which is horse racing, the Goodwood Festival of Speed, which is uphill climb racing, which attracts about 150,000 people every year to this house. And then the Goodwood Revival, which is golden era car racing, which is cars that were built between 1948 and 1966. Those are the only kinds of cars that are allowed to race. To put this into context, cast your mind back to 1999 
and the BBC slash PBS series Aristocrats. That was all about this family. It was filmed at this house, parts of it were, and these four sisters you see here were sisters of the man who's the focus of this, which is the third Duke of Richmond. And he plays a very small part in the TV series, but a very big part of the story we're talking about today. And what I love about him in this next painting um, is how real and human he is. This is um, by Batoni, who painted all the great English lords when they went to, to Italy. And it's important to me because of what it doesn't have in it. He's not wearing medals. He's not wearing fancy clothes. He's not wearing a wig. He doesn't have his arm around a beautiful woman. He's plain and he has his arm around dogs. He loved dogs, he loved people, he was a kind person. You can see here some of his accomplishments. He was the ambassador to France. He was a general at the age of 26, very unusually for his time in class. He believed that all men should have the right to vote. At this time, only people who owned property worth a certain amount could vote. And interestingly enough, he supported the American Revolution and sailed his yacht through the British fleet Anger, anchored at Spithead. That was an amazing act of defiance. Anybody else would have been arrested and possibly even executed because he was a duke. Nothing was done to him. He also loved great style. And um, he created the first complete Egyptian interior in Britain. This is the um, state dining room you see at Goodwood today. This was done because of Napoleon. Napoleon, of course, when he went in the 1790s on his Egyptian campaigns, brought artists with him and they did these illustrations that were brought back to the rest of Europe and created this whole craze for everything Egyptian. And the, the Duke was one of the very first people to implement this in a, an entire room. I say he loved animals. He had a menagerie, more or less a zoo. And um, one of the things he had there was the first male moose in England, which was sent to him from the Governor General of Canada. Um, he was so proud of this. He had George Stubbs. You'll see there's a theme here of Stubbs throughout this lecture. Stubbs painted the, this painting of this moose for him. Not really what kind of animal you want to go up and hug, but still something he was very proud of. The biggest reason we're here is because hunting, as in the hunt, began at Goodwood. Um, this is another Stubbs painting that shows the third duke with the Charlton hunt. This is the very first hunt that used hounds beginning in the 1670s. And the duke's father, the second duke in the 1720s, was the first person ever write down the rules of the hunt. People come here literally from all over the world today to honor the hunt. Sadly, the Charlton hunt does not exist anymore, um, but there's a lot of legacies here. You can see, for instance, um, the stables that the third Duke built at Goodwood for his horses, um, possibly even grander than the stables we saw at Wentworth Woodhouse. And of course, if you're going to go hunting, you can't just have horses, you have to have dogs. So look at the kennels that the third Duke built for his dogs, which is today um, a restaurant, the Charlton Hunt restaurant quite appropriately. Now, by the 19th century, horse racing was so big here, people came from all over the country to watch the horses. And by this time we had passed from match races into the kind of racing we think of today. And you can see in this 1853 hand colored engraving, what was going on at Goodwood. Um, there are 3,000 people in this painting, or this engraving, 2,000 people at the top there in the cheap seats, the nosebleed section, as I call it. Um, the second floor had the best views of the track and had the best rooms where you could place your bets. And then the bottom is where you could buy, um, I put down here, refreshment. That meant lots and lots of alcohol. This is the same view today because racing still takes place at Goodwood Horse Racing. But of course, we also have automobile racing today. And that's because of this man, the ninth Duke of Richmond, who in the 1920s, before he became Duke, um, became a mechanic um, for Bentley. For three years, he was a Bentley mechanic. He didn't care about horse racing. He liked cars. In 1929, he actually began racing himself. He won a few races, and in 1948, he founded what is, was then called the Goodwood Circuit. And you see in this next photograph, a 1950s image of the Goodwood Circuit. Um, this is something that was recreated by his grandson and is now, could, now called the Goodwood Revival Meeting. This is one I mentioned to you earlier that has only cars and motorcycles that were made between 1948 1966 are allowed to race. And not just that, 
attendees are encouraged to only wear clothes from that, that period. No cars can come close to this part of the estate that weren't made in that same time period. His grandson who did that um, is also an important racer himself and a professional photographer. This is him um, when he was the Earl of March. He's now the current Duke. As a friend of mine said, a British friend, he is unusually good looking for a Duke. He is absolutely hot. Um, now, let's talk about how he's making even more money from his Goodwood estate. This is one of the new buildings that was built in his estate. He leases this, this land um, and the building to this company who make these things um, there. And he thought this was an appropriate thing because of the history of Goodwood for him to be making. And I'm sure there are probably a number of you who are gonna know what these things are. Um, and you'll see in the next slide, for those of you like me who don't know, these are Rolls Royces. Rolls Royces are made exclusively on the Goodwood estate. And the reason for that is because in 1998, when BMW bought Rolls Royce, they did not buy any physical assets. They bought the name and they had to recreate everything else from scratch. They bought the plans, but they didn't have any plants left. So this was a perfect opportunity for Lord March to come in and say, hey, English car, make them in England on a great estate that has a history of racing. And that is exactly what happened. A number of you have said to me um, in emails over the past that you have um, not heard me talk about my cat who in previous um, webinars I've given for you guys has been protesting, I have not been paying attention to him. I'm not sure, oh, there he is, he's sitting in the sun now. Um, so I thought I'd end with a picture of Miles um, looking at his cutest. He is the center of my life these days, especially since COVID, he's the sweetest, dearest companion. Uh, and I just can't say enough about having a pet, particularly now. Thank you all so very much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Kurt, for that fascinating look at um, car racing, horse racing, planes, the jet set lifestyle, um, and through the lens of English country homes. So before we get to your questions, I do want to invite everyone to our next program in this series. So on Friday, September 11th, Kurt will be presenting All Roads Lead to London. You can register for this program and others at AmericanAncestors.org slash education slash online hyphen classes. And I'm also excited to announce or to provide kind of a teaser, uh, later this fall, Kurt will be leading a three-week online course, An Explosion of Beauty and Interior View of the Art and Architecture of the British Country House. So stay tuned for more information on that. All right, so let's get to your questions. Go ahead and type your query into the question panel and we'll answer as many as we can in the time provided. Um, so Fran asks, uh, you showed that beautiful um, chandelier from Easton Neston. Uh, do you know where that chandelier ended up? I do not know where that ended up. Um, it's interesting what happened in Easton Neston. It was bought, the house without any of its contents was bought by, um, an American Russian fashion designer called, I think, Leon Max, who um, uses it as his home and as his um, company headquarters. And he's had to refurnish the house by buying bits and pieces back. If anybody knows what happened to that chandelier, I would love if you could let me know at the email address you see on your screen. So the answer is, sadly, I don't know where it is now. Thanks. Uh, Frederick asks if you've published any books about some of the homes and houses that you showed us today. What a lovely question. Um, sort of is the answer. So I was one of the authors in a book called um, Villa Astor, which talks about um, a great estate in Italy on the Amalfi Coast. But it's I wrote the half of the book that talks about Lord Astor's English houses because this was actually William Waldorf Astor, who was at the time in the early 20th century, the richest man in the world. And he was an American, but he left America in a huff and never came back and moved to England and then had this estate in Italy as well. So I try to tie these bits and pieces together. So the answer is yes, a very specific book that talks about one man and his houses. And that of course is William Waldorf Astor. And I think it's still available on Amazon. And um, kind of associated with that, Amanda asks, you know, what 
other books might you suggest if you want to learn more about these properties and, and historic houses? Oh, heavens, Betsy, there are so many. Oh, my God. Um, as many of you have heard me say this before, uh, you can get graduate degrees from British universities and country house studies. There are so many books published every year. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I'm looking around me here in my bedroom. I have over 3,500 books on British art and architecture and history. And um, I can't keep up with the new ones that are being printed all the time. But probably the easiest thing to do is to go to Amazon and type in the name Jeremy Musson, J-E-R-E-M-Y, second name, M-U-S-S-O-N. He is a architectural writer, I'm a Brit, who writes the most luscious books, the greatest text in them. And he covers very broad-based things like an introduction to the country house, and it can give you a good taster with great photographs to go with it. Thanks. Uh, Jackson asks, are there any worthwhile estates in Swinton? Swinton or Swindon? S-W-I-N-D-O-N or T-O-N? Uh, it's written with a T. Um, I don't know. The answer is I don't know because I don't know where Swinton is. It sounds like a Scottish name, but I, I, the answer is I have no idea. What I could tell you, and I could probably try to do this myself, you could go to my website and type in Swinton and see what comes up in the, in the search field for the town name. All right. And um, another fun factoid uh, that Margaret um, included here is from uh, Margaret, a Kurt fan listener. Um, she says that <laughs> Sir Sean Connery, I think who was recently voted the most popular James Bond, I think everyone maybe thinks that, but um, is uh, turning 90 on August 25th. So happy birthday, uh, Sir Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah, amazing. He, as far as I know, he still lives in New York City. If you, you can do a Google search for him today, pictures Sean Connery today. He's a scary looking old man now, like everyone who gets to be 90 looks. Um, and Carl asks, was there, do you know if there was a competition between Le Mans and Kent with car racing? These are two, I think, racetracks. Um, yeah. Th that's interesting. Um, competition in the sense that they were, Le Mans was very aware of what was going on at Goodwood in particular. And as a matter of fact, now the, um, the current Goodwood schedule is purposely done to avoid Le Mans so they don't overlap. Um, Le Mans is still much more famous and much more important. But um, certainly, I, I would say that the Goodwood various races that take place there are seen, they see themselves as competitors to the great continental races for sure. Um, and Nan asks if you can repeat the, the name of the book um, that you referenced on the last English dynasties. Last English dynasty is it, oh I think Black Diamonds is um I think I think that's the one she's yes, talking about. Yeah. So, so so it's Black Diamonds, and if you go to Amazon and go and search just in the book section for Black Diamonds, it should come up. So it's called The Decline and Fall of a I think an English Aristocracy or Aristocratic Family, something like that. Um, it will it will come up. Catherine Bailey is the author's name. It will come up pretty quickly. I think it's still in print. It's such a page turner. I mean, it's it's like a soap opera. And as I said, it's all true. So it makes it even more delicious. Uh, and Rachel asks, was there any connection between Easton Neston and Silverstone Racing Circuit? Um, she says, thought you were going to go there, given its proximity to Toaster. Um, but perhaps there was no link. <laughs> um, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. There could. My guess is there probably is a link. Um, Toaster, very sadly, because of the bank, well, I shouldn't say bankruptcy, because of the money troubles of Lord Heskus, Toaster was sold off, and I think now is just Greyhound racing. They don't do any other kind of racing there. But my guess is that all those courses were related to each other, and the fact that they were close to each other was not an accident. Now, I feel like we get this question every time, and it's a good question, um, but Maureen <laughs> Set asks, what do you consider to be the greatest English country house? Oh my God, that's so hard to answer. Um, I hate, it's like having children and saying you have one that's a favorite. I hate to show preference, but um, if the one that, it, that I think ticks all the boxes, as they would say in the UK, is Chatsworth, because it's still owned by the original family, their dukes, the house is amazing, the collection is amazing, the grounds are amazing, the history is amazing, 
it, it, it has everything. They have incredible shops. <laughs> they just know how to do it. Um, it's not my favorite house, but it's the one that I think perfectly captures what a British country house is. And I'm not mistaken, it's been voted by more than one organization as the best English historic house. And another really nice question. Um, I'm, all of these are really great questions. Uh, Elizabeth asks, what sparked your interest in English architecture and history? And she also says, by the way, Miles is very handsome. And there were several comments <laughs> about how <laughs> handsome your cat and how beautiful and perfect, pun intended, your cat is. <laughs> he, he, I think he thinks so too, um, at least most of the time. Um, I, I think the easy answer to that question of how did I get started is I was a very strange kid. Um, when I was probably like 12, um, all of my best friends were women who were the age of 80 or older. And one of those women, Mrs. Lindemann, who lived across the street from me, um, her son was an architect and she gave me my first book on British country houses, which I still have. And I had always loved British history. I, I, I was a really weird kid. I remember when I was five, I asked for Santa Claus to bring me a purple book on the history of the British monarchy because I discovered the purple was a royal color. And I can still remember what I got. My parents obviously thought he can be so sort of tossed off as any purple book. I got Pinocchio with a purple cover. And I never forgave Santa Claus for that. So when Mrs. Lindemann um, brought this thing together of my love of British history with a specific kind of British architecture, it just sort of brought all these pieces into place. And I, um, the thing about British country houses, country houses has existed, of course, in other European countries, but never in the same way they did as in Britain. And most importantly, they don't survive today the way they do in Britain. And the reason they survive only in Britain in the quantity they do and then the original ownership like they do is because of primogeniture, which is the eldest male inheriting everything. Um, on the continent, mainly because of the Napoleonic Code, um, everything is divided equally among all the heirs. The widow, the children all get the same exact portion of the estate, which of course is very fair. But the English say the only way these estates can be passed one from one generation to another, they can't be broken up. So the eldest male child gets everything and the other kids get nothing. And therefore they get passed down. So you have these pieces of history that are actually very feudal and the way they're organized. And Chatsworth is a great example of that. When the late Duke of Devonshire from Chatsworth died, probably about 10 years ago now, there's a famous photograph of his hearse driving from the house to the church, which of course he owned. And all the staff were standing on both sides of the road in evenly spaced um, divisions in honor of this man. That's very futile. There was a, a coronet on the top of the car indicating his ducal status. That wouldn't happen anywhere else but in Britain. And Catherine asks, are any English country houses self-sustaining or have they all had to open to the public to keep the homes in the family? Um, many of them are self-sustaining. Um, now, Chatsworth is a good example, actually, because it is self-sustaining and it is open to the public. So I think I don't think it's fair to say that it's not self-sustaining if it's open to the public. Um, because that's part of how it sustains itself. The important distinction to make here is that most houses that are open to the public lose money. They don't make money from being open to the public. Unlike Chatsworth or Blenheim, which make money from being open, these houses are forced to open because they have tax breaks from the government. And the government says, okay, we're not going to charge you inheritance tax on those Rembrandts, but in exchange, the Rembrandts have to be made available to the public for 28 days a year. And that is actually the number, usually 28 days. So you have to make it available to the public. And that's why most of them are open. Of the approximately 1,000 houses that are open to the public in one way or another in Britain, um, that's actually a minority of the houses. They, there could be up to 8,000 of these houses that still exist. Nobody actually knows the exact number. So if you say of 8,000 houses, 1,000 are open to the public, that means 7,000 are not open to the public and they are completely self-sustaining, mainly from agricultural land. Thank you. Um, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, have you visited Scottish country homes and castles? And I think the answer is a big yes. Um, do you want to say anything about those? <laughs> um, the answer is a big yes. I worked for probably about 
12 years for the National Trust for Scotland, who owns, of course, a lot of Scottish country houses. Um, Scotland, like Wales, has fewer houses, a lot fewer than England, because Scotland and Wales were always much poorer than England, so there wasn't as much money to build these houses. But they are still there and in great numbers. And Scottish houses, especially in the border with England, are very much closer in design to English houses. It's hard to tell the difference, actually. But when you go deeper into Scotland and further north, you get a distinctive architecture called the Scottish baronial style that only exists in Scotland. If it exists anywhere else in England or Australia or America, it's a copy of a Scottish idiom. And Scottish houses, are supposedly the most haunted houses in the world because they're actually maps of the world colored in red where there are repeated ghost signings. And the whole country of Scotland is solid red um, because it's so haunted. And I remember a friend said to me, that's because it's so old. I said, well, that's bull because Greece and Italy are a lot older than England. They're nowhere near as haunted. So Scotland gets the crown for the most hauntings. And I'm, I've never experienced these myself, but I've had friends who've been sleeping next to me in rooms in Scottish castles who have told me stories about how they were visited in the night by a ghost. Um, I, I will have to tell you my favorite story about um, a Scottish castle called Fivey Castle that was lived in by a friend of mine who was the manager of the house. And he told me the strangest story. I personally don't believe in ghosts and he doesn't either, or he didn't, but he went down one morning to turn off the alarms to open the house up to the public. And this is a very big house. Um, its oldest parts go back to the 12th century. And in the 19th section of 19th century section of the house, everything had been rearranged. All the furniture, all the paintings, everything was in a different spot than it had been before. And he thought someone was playing a joke on him. So he went to look at the code for the motion detector to see if somebody had turned it off in the middle of the night. And it had never been turned off. And it took the trust weeks to get all the furniture and the hangings back to the way it was before. So that's weird. How did that happen? And the fact that it took weeks to put it back meant how could one person have done it in a night? And of course, the answer is it couldn't have been a person that had to be supernatural. Fast forward 10 years, and they're going through the attics. And then I come across some photos of that room from the 1890s that had never been known before. And there, are exactly that room as it was found that morning, rearranged as it was in the 1890s. And this sort of dovetails with the idea that there is one of the ghosts that haunts this house, and there's more than one ghost that haunts Fivey Castle, um, is a woman who built this wing in the 1890s and decorated it. And the theory is she was unhappy with how, with how the trust arranged it. So she redecorated it herself one night the way she wanted it. That's what Scotland is a large part to me. And not to mention, I can remember being in Scotland in August when it was 30 degrees. So it, if, you, if you dislike hot weather, Scotland is the place for you. I was in Scotland for my honeymoon in August, so it was great. I loved it. <laughs> I do too. I hate I hate hot weather, so I I think it's perfect. Um, if anybody watched um, has ever watched the, the British TV show Little Britain, <laughs> they have a running skit. Um, <laughs> of these, the, it always takes place in Scotland, and it shows a man and a woman in a bathing suit on a chaise lounge in front of a Scottish castle, and it's pouring rain. It's dark out, and the voiceover says, "Taking your holidays this year, and find that the Arctic is booked. Why not try Scotland?" And the, <laughs> every episode, it's like that. Find that Siberia just is too much this year. Try Scotland instead. That's not fair because Scotland is not like Siberia, but if you are like me and you don't like hot weather, Scotland is the place to be. And Scotland, as a lot of people will tell you, this is not true just of Scotland. The further you go from London, the friendlier the people become. And I think that's certainly true about Scotland. Well, thank you. And I said one other question, um, and it's kind of a question slash plea. Uh, Sandra <laughs> asks, is there any chance Kurt would do a talk on uh, Irish country houses? You know, that's, um, yes, I have never done one, but that's, um, I can guess who that Sandra is, Sandra, I'm guessing. Um, it's a great idea. And um, I did a tour last year, I think it was last year, to, to Irish country houses. Ireland has, in my opinion, the second greatest collection of country houses in the British Isles. The first is England, the second is Ireland, the third is Scotland, and the fourth is Wales. And um, 
the Irish houses are just fantastic. Um, sadly, an awful lot of them were destroyed during the Troubles, um, during Irish independence in the 1920s. But now there's a reappreciation for these houses. And they were destroyed because the native Irish saw them as examples, quite rightly, of British imperialism. And now the Irish are saying, this is part of our history and we need to embrace it and preserve it and talk about it. So yes, that's a great idea. And I will put that into my thinking cap and come up in 2021 with an Irish country houses lecture. Done. Wow, what a promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Kurt. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. But if you do have other questions, and I know that there were um, several questions that we didn't get to today, um, you can always reach out to Kurt at heritagetours at nehgs.org. You see that on your screen, and I will also include that email in my follow-up um, email later today. So I want to thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more programs for you and others to enjoy. If you'd like to learn more about American ancestors and the fabulous heritage tours, many of which are led by Kurt, please visit AmericanAncestors.org slash heritage hyphen tours. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.